Welcome to Anatomy with Amy. In this video, I'm going to talk to you about the ankle joint, the subtalar joint, and then at the end of the video, we will cover five reasons why an inversion sprain is more common than an eversion sprain. So let's start with the first one. So the ankle joint um, is also referred to as the talo joint or the ankle mortise joint. So I'm going to write those down so you can have those. So sometimes it's referred to as the ankle mortise or the talocrural. This just depends on which text you're reading. Okay, and talocrural making reference to the two bones that are making contact with each other. So talo is making reference to the talus and then the Crura is like the arch that's made up between the distal aspect of the tibia and the distal aspect of the fibula. So this is our true ankle joint. This particular joint is responsible for plantar flexion and dorsiflexion. Plantar flexion is when the bottom aspect um, of our foot or our toes go towards the plants. So when we point our toes down, that's plantar flexion. When we draw the toes up towards the shin bone, this is dorsiflexion. So at the talocrural joint, the movement that's permitted at this joint is plantar flexion and dorsiflexion. The other joint that often gets wrapped into this ankle joint is called the subtalar joint. And I'll share that with you as well. So below that is the subtalar. And what this name is making reference to, sub is below, and Taylor making reference to the talus. So this particular joint is made up between the talus and the calcaneus and the articulation there. So when I talk about articulation, it's just a fancy word for one bone touching another bone, okay? And that's what a joint is. So the joint or the articulation between two bones. The movement that's permitted the sub Taylor joint is inversion and eversion. Learning this movement can be a little bit tricky and it often trips up my students and um, they get mixed up or they get backwards. So we need to know which aspect of the foot we're making reference to when we're talking about the direction that the foot is moving. So when we talk about inversion and eversion, we want to talk about where the plantar aspect or the bottom aspect of the foot, which direction it's going. So it's going in or to inversion when this plantar aspect of the foot is moving towards the midline of the body. So if I show you from this lateral perspective, if closer to me is the midline of the body, this is inversion, the bottom of the foot is pointing in towards me. Eversion is where the bottom of the foot is turning outwards. And even right now, I feel like um, you can see it with Bonesy here. Inversion, there's a lot more movement permitted in inversion than eversion. We're going to talk about why that is and how it impacts injury. So these are the two joints we're going to look at, the talocrural and the subtalar when we're talking about the ankle joint. So there are five primary reasons why we're more likely to have an inversion sprain than an eversion sprain. Three of these five, we don't have any control over because they're structural. They're not functional. So structural means it's the makeup of our body. It's just how we're designed. We don't really have a lot of um, impact as a therapist over those three things. The last two I'm gonna to talk to you about, we do have some ability to control or manipulate as therapists when we give our patients stretches and strengthening uh, exercises to do to support and rehabilitate the ankle. So let's talk about the first three. The first one, we're gonna look at the shape of the talus. So I'm gonna show you a closer up version, but you can see here, so this is from like a superior aspect looking down onto talus. We're not talking about the head of talus or the neck of talus. So right now we're not talking about that part of it. What I want you to pay attention to is this very superior aspect here that articulates or touches the crura or the tibia and fibula. So if we're looking at this most superior aspect of the talus there, the shape of talus is what we're interested in. And if I were to be able to pop these off and sort of let you look right in there, what you would see is a shape that looks kind of like 
this. Now, it's going to be a little bit of an exaggeration. The posterior aspect is not that narrow, but it's close enough and it's gonna help you visualize in your mind what the shape of talus is. So if I offer this up as a visual for the shape, this front part is the anterior aspect. This back part is the posterior aspect of talus. When the ankle joint moves in plantar flexion and dorsiflexion, the talus slides anterior and posterior. It's gonna move front to back. When the foot is in plantar flexion, toes to the ground, the talus slides anteriorly. When the talus slides anteriorly, the posterior aspect of it lives in between the two malleoli. So when we're looking at joints, very generally speaking, when we have high congruency, what that means is we have a lot of bone touching a lot of other bone, high congruency. So I'll give you an example. If we look at the hip, we have the head of the femur with the acetabulum sitting around it, okay? So we have a lot of bone touching a lot of other bone. Not a lot of wiggle room, a lot of congruency, a lot of stability. When we have low congruency, which is what happens in our shoulder joint as an example, where we have this really shallow cavity and then the head of the humerus, there's a lot of movement permitted in the shoulder, but it's less stable. So when we apply this to the ankle joint, when the ankle is in plantar flexion, the talus slides anterior, which means the posterior aspect is now in between the malleoli. So if I were to give you a visual this way, we've got our two malleoli. The posterior aspect is in between the two malleoli and there's a lot of wiggle room there. This is one of the least stable ankle positions. When we're in plantar flexion, there's so much movement permitted that we're more likely to go into an inverted position and so far that can be problematic. When we take the foot into a dorsiflexed position, the talus will slide posterior, which means the anterior aspect is now going to be in between the two malleoli. So if I have my two malleoli here again, that talus is gonna slide posterior. Now I've got this anterior aspect that's wedged in between the malleoli, which creates high congruency. High congruency means a lot of stability, limited mobility. So this is kind of like a like a locked ankle position. It's very strong and we're less likely to invert the ankle. So most inversion sprains occur when the person is in a plantar flex position. This is super common to see in sports in like a lot of jumping sports and I'll give you an example of volleyball. So when an athlete takes off, they jump, they push off, they come up into the air, when they land, they don't land in a flat-footed position. They don't land on their heel. That's really jarring and it doesn't cushion any of the forces. So after an athlete has jumped and they're coming to land, they land with the balls of their feet and then they get onto their heel. So as they're landing, if they come down onto an uneven surface, they're going to be in this plantar flex position. And this is our weakest ankle position, which means we're more likely to roll and go into that inversion sprain. So we can take that into consideration uh, when we're looking at mechanism of injury, what position was the ankle in uh, when the movement of inversion occurred. The second reason structurally why we're more likely to have an inversion sprain versus an eversion sprain is the level of the malleoli. So I'm gonna create some visuals here. So what I want you to look at is the level of the malleoli. So don't take my word for it. After you watch this, go find a friend. You can even look at it on yourself. I want you to measure the level of the malleoli. And what do you notice when you look at this here? You'll notice that the medial malleolus sits more superior and the lateral malleolus projects further distally. And this is really important. This is important because these two bony areas can create a bony block. The bony block can resist or prevent movement. So when one bone runs into another bone, it's 
going to stop some motion, okay? So when we're in um, this plantar flexed position, if I try to evert the foot, so this plantar aspect of the foot going outwards or away from the midline of the body, the talus is gonna run into the lateral malleolus quickly. So this bony block resists or stops a lot of the eversion movement. When we're looking at the medial malleolus, because it sits higher, when the person goes into an inversion movement, it takes a lot longer for this talus to run into the medial malleolus. So we can get a lot further into inversion, and you can see with the movement in bone Z, we get stopped there in eversion. Look what happens when we're in plantar flexion, and then we try to invert the foot. Okay, we have significantly more motion. So when that happens, that bony block doesn't stop the movement quite as quickly. So we get further into that inversion movement. So the second reason why inversion sprains are more common is um, that more movement is permitted in inversion because it doesn't get blocked quite as quickly against that medial malleolus. The third thing we'll look at is the ligamentous support. So if we want to look at the ligaments that live on the lateral aspect of the ankle versus the ligaments that live on the medial aspect of the ankle, they're designed quite a bit differently. Ligaments are designed to attach bone to bone. Okay, so that's by definition, they attach bone to bone. But their purpose or their job or their function is to resist or limit excessive motion. So we are designed to have some movement. The bones are allowed to come apart a little bit, but when the bones start to come apart more than we're designed to do, the ligaments say, no, 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 hold the bone together. They're designed to create this support that limits excessive motion. However, if we put enough force through a ligament, it can only resist up to a certain point and then it will fail, which creates a tearing of the ligament. So if we look first at this medial aspect of the ankle, we have what's called the deltoid ligament. And so it's not on this model, but I'll show you the shape of it in a picture. So the shape of it kind of looks like this. It's got these really thick bands and they're arranged in this like triangular or deltoid shape. So because they live on this medial aspect of the ankle and they limit motion, when the ankle tries to evert, these ligaments that live on the medial aspect are like, nope, they're gonna hold on strong and they're gonna resist eversion. When we go to the other side of the ankle, the lateral aspect, the ligaments that live on this side of the ankle aren't quite as strong, they're thinner they don't hold quite as strong, and so they can't quite resist the same amount of force that the deltoid ligaments can. So when the ankle is going into inversion, these tiny, weaker ligaments are a lot more likely to give or to tear when the force goes through the ankle. So one of the most commonly torn or the first that's torn ligaments of the ankle is the ATFL, the anterior anterior talofibular ligament. Um, and that's when forces are put through the ankle. So when the ankle is going into inversion, these ligaments are gonna try to resist that inversion. And when the force is too great, they are compromised, they fail, and then we have a tear of the lateral ligaments. So those are the three structural reasons why we're more likely to have an inversion sprain than an eversion sprain. The two reasons that we do have some control over um, are tension through the posterior aspect of the um, leg, which pulls us into plantar flexion, and some weakness in the lateral muscles. So let's break each of those down. So if we're looking at the posterior aspect of the leg, these are where our calf muscles live. And the two primary ones that we'll talk about are gastrocnemius and soleus. These two muscles live on the back of the leg. They're the calf muscles. They both have attachment into calcaneus here. And when these calf muscles fire or shorten or contract, they pull up on the calcaneus and they draw the foot into plantar flexion. So these are the main muscles of plantar flexion. 
when they are tight and they're very commonly tight on a lot of people, they hold that tension, which makes the person sort of live in this plantar flexed position, um, even when these muscles are at rest. So we sort of sit in this weakened ankle position. So as therapists, what we can do is we can create length through these calf muscles by stretching them. So we wanna stretch gastrocnemius and stretch soleus. And then as a follow-up to that, we wanna have our patients to work on strengthening muscles that live on the front part of the lower leg, which will draw the foot into dorsiflexion. So we wanna work on strengthening the ankle dorsiflexors and we wanna stretch the ankle plantar flexors so the foot is capable of living in more of a neutral position. The second thing that we have impact over is muscles that live on the lateral aspect of the lower leg. These are our, our fibularis or peroneal muscles. So again, depending on which text you read, they may be called different things. Fibularis, F-I-B-U-L-A-R-I-S. -E fibularis or peroneals. Okay, and they're making reference to the same thing, just different texts uh, name them different things. So they live on the lateral aspect of the lower leg. These muscles are typically weak. So their responsibility or their job, partly at the subtalar joint specifically, is to evert the foot. So these muscles come down the lateral aspect of the leg, um, one of them attaches onto the fifth digit. The other one attaches all the way underneath the foot um, over onto the first digit. So when they tighten and contract, they pull the foot into eversion. So if we can create some strength through these fibularis muscles, then we can help the ankle resist the movement of inversion. So I'll give you an example. If a person is stepping off of a curb, they step down with their toes, they, maybe it's slippery, maybe they step onto something uneven, and the ankle starts to go into inversion. If these muscles, the fibularis or peroneal muscles, are strong enough and they're able to react, they're gonna get stretched out a little bit and the body's gonna say, oh, that's too far, and it's gonna fire them, and it's gonna pull the ankle back into neutral or more of an everted position. And this is what we want. This is the response we want of the body so we don't go even further into that inversion movement. So if we can create some nice strength through these muscles that live on the lateral aspect of the lower leg, it will help protect the ankle. I hope this video was helpful and informative. If you have any questions, drop them below. I'm happy to answer and we'll see you in the next video.